right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for tuning in after a long day. Thank you again so much for joining our Young Alumni Series event, Investing Basics with Canvas Credit Union. My name is Sophie Matthews, and I am the Student and Recent Graduate Engagement Specialist with the CSU Alumni Association. I want to go ahead and thank all of you for participating this evening. And as we're opening tonight, please go ahead and put in the comments where you're watching from and if you are an alum, what year you graduated. Wherever you're tuning in from, we are so glad that you all are here today. This event is part of our Young Alumni Series, which we partner with Canvas Credit Union on with the hope of providing some resources on applicable life skills and topics for both those of us who are newer alums, um, as well as those of us who may not have recently graduated, but are equally as interested in the topics. We are so excited to bring our alums from all different backgrounds, young, old, around the country, around the world, international, all together um, to coordinate events that represent you as well as educate, inform, and sometimes hopefully entertain you. All right, we would like to also thank our CSU Alumni Association members. It really does make events like this possible. Um, we're so grateful for you and all of your membership to make events like this as well as our community connections possible. To learn more about membership and to explore all that the Alumni Association has to offer, feel free to download our mobile app. All right, we'll begin in just a moment as people are beginning to roll on in. If you do have any te technical difficulties, please let us know via the comment section and I will be in touch with you to help. I'll go ahead and also drop my email in the comments in just a minute so that you can also reach me directly via email. This presentation today is recorded and will post immediately onto our YouTube channel after the event. However, we will be pivoting to a Zoom webinar after the formal presentation for Q&A session that will not be recorded. Please join us after this in that session. I'll be posting the link in the comments for that, um, and we'll remind you as the presentation goes on. We'll also be sending out a survey link in addition to the recording of tonight's program in an email later this week. If you could please take a moment to fill that out, we would really appreciate your feedback. And now I am excited to introduce you to tonight's guest speaker, Ryan Muff, a lead financial advisor at Canvas Credit Union. Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the Asset Allocation Balancing Your Risks and Rewards presentation, and it is a part of the Investment Basics series. Um, we are going to have a question and answer session immediately following this presentation via Zoom. And that will be your opportunity to ask any question, <clears throat> ask any specific questions. Um, and uh, we'll have that information heading your direction soon. So today we're talking about asset allocation. And um, I'm a, a lead financial advisor with Canvas Advisors. We have a variety of advisors all throughout Colorado, even on the Western Slope now. And um, I'm looking forward to being, being able to help however I may, uh, especially through education. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. So let's get started on why asset allocation is important and how it is designed to balance risks and rewards to help you reach your goals. I would like to apologize in the event that it feels like I'm reading from a script, I am. The compliance team really likes it if I stick to my script. These are the topics we'll be focusing on today. By the time we're three through, you will understand how asset allocation works and why it can be a very important tool in your investment strategy. You'll have more insights into the different types of investments used as strategic tools for asset allocation and hopefully understand a little bit better how to calculate your own asset allocation. First, let's review what asset allocation means. Basically, it's dividing an investment portfolio strategically between different asset categories such as stocks, bonds, and cash or cash equivalents. The mix of assets should be determined by your investment goals, your time horizon, and your ability to tolerate risk. Simply put, asset allocation is a way to keep us from putting all of our eggs 
in one basket so we can do a better job of balancing potential risks while pursuing potential returns. Experts agree that it can also be one of the most important decisions an investor can make. One of the most often cited examples of its power is determinants of portfolio performance. This is a study done um, in 1986. It was updated again in 1991 with results that continue to be validated and referenced by financial experts. Once again, the name of that is determinants, determinants of portfolio performance. Um, in it, a group of researchers studied data from 82 large pension plans and determined that the key driver in returns for these portfolios during the study's timeline was their asset allocation. How those assets were allocated among different investment classes accounted on average for about 90% of their variability. One of the authors was Gary Brinson. Um, he did an interview in 2006 for Wealth Manager magazine. In the, in the event that you'd like to search for this article, uh, Gary P. Brinson, Determinants of Portfolio Performance is what you'll punch into the Google machine. There are a lot of investment options out there, stocks and stock mutual funds, corporate and municipal bonds, bond mutual funds, life cycle funds, uh, slash target date funds, uh, exchange traded funds, money market funds, and treasury securities. These options boil down to three basic categories, stocks, bonds, and cash or cash equivalents. These three asset classes come with different levels of risk and returns and react differently in various circumstances and time frames. Let's talk about the different asset categories. Yep, just making sure I'm in the right place in both different uh, programs. Uh, let's talk about the different asset categories. Simply put, a stock represents ownership in a company. A bond is basically an IOU that a borrower, such as a government organization or corporation, gives to an investor, promising interest payments and future repayment of the loan. Cash securities are short-term investments, such as treasury bills that can be converted readily into cash, which is why they're sometimes called cash equivalents. Now let's look more closely at each type of investment and refer to this chart, which provides context for how different categories performed between 1926 and 1915. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> 2015. Between 1926 and 2015. This is what we refer to as the Ibbotson chart, named for researcher, author, and university professor Roger Ibbotson. As an FYI, the initial investment for each of these investments uh, is in 1926 was a hypothetical value of $1. The green line tagged here as treasury bills is helpful in representing the cash and cash equivalents category, including money markets. You'll see that the initial $1 investment had a compound annual return of 3.4% and is worth $21 after 89 years. It barely edged out over inflation which averaged 2.9%. Because it offers the least risk and the lowest rate of return, it may be the most appropriate for short-term goals or emergency savings. Next, let's look at the orange line, which represents government bonds. The $1 investment increased to $132, a 5.6% compound annual return over 89 years. What's interesting about these green and orange lines is that neither one goes into negative territory even after the major stock crash that helped launch the Great Depression. I'm speculating here, but I think it's safe to say that the orange line would have shown a higher compound annual return if corporate bonds had been included, not just government bonds. Bonds produced an annualized return of 6.1% over the 30-year period ending December 31st, 2018, this compares to a 9.97% return for stocks during the same period as measured by the S&P 500. 
Bonds as an asset class pose less risk than stocks and also offer a wider range of risk return potential, ranging from the safest government-backed securities to high-risk junk bonds, also uh, triple B bonds. Now look at the black and blue lines, which spent a lot of time in negative territory during the Depression. The blue line, large stocks, showed an annual return of 10%, turning $1 into $5,390. Small stocks, the dark blue line, had, an an had a compound annual return of 12% during the 89-year span, ultimately turning the $1 investment into $26,400. And $33. Investors who aren't sure or how much they want to invest in different asset categories may want to explore the options mutual funds present. Mutual funds make it easier for investors to diversify because they pool money from many investors to invest in stocks, bonds, and other financial instruments. The ultimate investing decisions are made by professional money managers. Mutual fund investments enable you to own a small portion of many different investments, helping you to balance your potential risks and rewards. Losses on some securities can potentially be offset by gains made by others. You need to know, however, that not all mutual fund investments provide automatic diversification because some focus on particular industry sectors. Choosing a mutual fund still requires attention to detail and or research to determine if it's right for you. Request a prospectus for the mutual fund you're considering and read it carefully to learn about its investment objectives, fees, and potential risks. Investment professionals can also be very helpful resources for helping you to decide which funds to choose. Now that we've looked at a couple different asset categories, which we consider to be the tools for your investment strategy, let's look at how you might combine them to pursue your goals. Whatever your financial goals are, the time to start building or fine tuning your strategy is now. Different goals may require particular investments, allocations, and timelines to achieve. If you haven't already, start setting or confirming your goals. Determine your timelines for reaching them and consider how much, if any, you've already accumulated for those goals. Then ask yourself, how much risk are you willing to take? Your earliest goal might be building emergency savings in case you or a family member are in serious in a serious accident or encounter or encounter other unforeseen circumstances. The latest goal in your timeline might be retiring comfortably in 25 to 30 years. Both of those are important goals, but don't lose sight of retirement just because the first goal in your timeline is establishing an emergency fund work them both into your plans. Retirement is one of the biggest accumulation goals you'll have and should always be in the forefront of your financial strategy. Your goals and timelines are the biggest factors in how to allocate your money. Each goal must be considered for creating the appropriate asset mix. You'll also need to take your risk tolerance into account. You can set targets and then rebalance your portfolio periodically to adjust as needed. If you want your money to grow, and who doesn't, your allocation would likely include investments that target growth, such as stocks. If you're less inclined to take risks, you may want to allocate it more conservatively. Everyone has their own opinion about what their most important goals are, and that's the way it should be. But I'd like to point out that saving for retirement is probably the most important goal because most of us will be spending 25 to 30% of our lifetimes retired, hopefully. There is growing insecurity about Social Security's ability to fully compensate future retirees, so it is very important to be prepared. To ensure you've got enough for retirement saved, most experts recommend saving at least 10% of your income 
But this is not a one size fits all scenario. And a 40 year old who's just starting to save for retirement might need a different strategy than someone who's in their 20s. Emergency savings should also be a high priority. Make sure you have at least three months worth of living expenses in case you become unemployed, seriously ill, injured, or disabled. I tend to prefer six months worth of emergency savings, but it is a relative um, measurement. If you have kids, you'll probably want to prepare for their college education costs along with the timeline. As a FYI, for a public non a public four-year college, in-state students paid tuition and fees averaging $10,440 a year in the 2019-2020 school year, an increase of 2.3% from the previous year. However, yearly tuition and fees at private four-year colleges reached $36,880 in 2019 to 2020, an increase of 3.4%. If you want to buy a new home or make an investment in a vacation home, you should have 10 to 20% of the purchase price available as a down payment. These are some of the most common goals people set. After you've decided on your goals, it's time to set your timeline and decide how to allocate your assets. After you've established your goals, the next step is determining your personal tolerance for investment risk and how you can make it work within your timeline. Your risk tolerance will depend a lot on your timeline. If you have 20 years before you need your money for your goal, you might wanna consider investing more in stocks because you'll have more time to ride out any short-term fluctuations. You need to keep in mind though, that holding a particular stock for 20 years comes with no guarantees. You may still lose money. If you need your money in five or 10 years, you may want to be more moderate. A lot of investors choose bonds and money market instruments for shorter term goals with a more moderate investment in stocks. As you approach the time frame when you'll be liquidating your investment to apply toward your goal, you need to remember to review your allocation. If you haven't accumulated enough for your goal, you may want to consider a more aggressive allocation to try to make up for the shortfall or not. The important thing is to always consider how much risk of loss you are comfortable with. Again, the most important thing is to always consider how much risk of loss you are comfortable with. Let's look at a few examples of common goals and time frames so you can think about how you might allocate your assets to achieve these financial objectives. We've set up some sample portfolios for these four types of goals. To clarify, these are just examples and not meant as specific investment advice. The goals fall into four broad categories with varying time horizons. Emergency funds, uh, major purchases within the next five years, accumulation goals for retirement or kids' college expenses, and wealth preservation, which usually includes retirees who hope to live, uh, who hope to remain retired for at least another 25 years. Setting aside money for emergency funds is an example of hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. Experts recommend having emergency funds to cover three to six months of living expenses just in case you lose your job, are involved in a car accident, or face another unexpected emergency. These funds are to cover necessary expenses such as food, water, electricity, heat, rent, or mortgage, insurance, health care costs, and debt payments. You can do without discretionary spending, such as entertainment, dining out, shopping, gym memberships, subscription services like Netflix, and maybe even cable. If you haven't already set up a budget to determine what your expenses are, I recommend doing that soon. 
Investing emergency funds can make them more difficult to access in emergencies. Many investors start with a high yield savings account because the money is liquid, accessible, and typically insured by the FDIC or NCUA. However, because interest rates on savings accounts are relatively low, often below inflation rates, you may want to keep only two to three weeks worth of expenses in a high yield savings account and consider other options with higher returns for the rest of your emergency emergency fund. Some options to include cons- uh, some options to consider include certificates of deposits or, or CDs, money market accounts, money market mutual funds, um, index or exchange traded funds, health savings accounts. I have mixed feelings about the last two or three of those. Be sure you read the fine print. So you know about any restrictions or penalties that might apply, though. Deciding where to keep your emergency fund is a personal financial choice, and you need to do your homework before deciding which option you're considering to make sure you understand the potential risks and potential rewards. If you're planning to make a major purchase like a home or a car in the next five years, you may want to consider a moderate growth portfolio. In this example, Uh, 60% is invested in stocks and 37% is invested in bonds. The remaining 3% is allocated to cash and treasury inflation protected securities or TIPS, which are bonds issued by the U.S. Treasury to help guard against inflationary impacts. When you're planning ahead for your kids' college or other goals at least 10 years down the road, you probably want a portfolio that's a little bit more aggressive. You'll take on more risk, but have the potential for more rewards. The longer timeline should give you the opportunity to ride out any short-term fluctuations you may encounter. In this hypothetical example for an aggressive portfolio, 5% of the investments are in bonds and 95% in stocks. Keep in mind though, that you may want to modify your allocations as you approach the date for accessing your investment for your kids' college expenses or whatever goal you've set for that time frame. If your 10 plus year goal is for your own retirement, you may want to add tax deferred accounts into the mix, such as 401ks, IRAs, Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs. There was emphasis on the Roth part, in case you didn't notice. A conservative portfolio is often used for wealth preservation and can help retirees make their savings last. This hypothetical allocation is designed to do that with primarily conservative instruments that can help protect what you've accumulated over the years. It has 73% invested in bonds, 20% in stocks, 2% in cash, and 5% in tips. It may be 25 years before you plan to retire, but you could live another 30 years or more after that. The goal of a conservative portfolio is to provide investment income and help guard against the risk of inflation and loss. Let's talk now about risk and how you might want to manage it. These two charts give you an idea of two sample portfolios and their performance over the same 30-year period. The average return for the all-stock portfolio was 9.97%, and its risk level was a relatively high 17.19%. The portfolio of 60% stocks, 30% bonds, and 10% cash or cash equivalents had a slightly lower return of 8.37% but a much lower risk level of 10.8%. It's always important to remember, though, that past performance cannot guarantee future results. However, this example helps illustrate how important asset allocation can be in managing risk. Allocating your assets is not a one-time decision. You need to recognize that you may need to make adjustments based on what's going on in your life. Maybe your job has changed. 
Maybe you're getting married or divorced or had kids. These are just a few examples of the kinds of changes that could signal it's, a time, it's time to review your financial goals and your allocations. I recommend that you review your asset allocations at least once a year, even if there haven't been any big changes in your life. You might discover that market performance has shifted your allocations without you even realizing it. As I mentioned earlier, you also need to consider allocation changes as your timeline shortens for certain goals, such as your kids' starting college or when your retirement gets nearer. If all of this seems a little overwhelming or confusing, you're not alone. There's a lot to digest, and a financial professional can help you establish your objectives and timelines and make rep recommendations that should help you meet your goals. There are also a lot of other helpful resources you can use to learn more about allocating your investments. In addition to a financial consultant, you might find that professional and business groups can be a helpful networking and informational tool. Some people have learned a lot by joining an investment club and hearing about others' plans and experiences. And don't forget about your public library as well as reliable, trustworthy online resources where you'll find valuable investment publications and books. The more information you have, the better prepared you'll be. We've covered a lot of ground today with a detailed look at how asset allocation can be used as a very important tool in determining your financial future. I hope you'll apply what you've learned to your own financial plans and that it helps you achieve or even surpass the goals and timelines you've set. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have in the in the uh, Zoom session following. The information is in the comments. So um, please log into the Zoom session if you have any questions. Now I'll turn it over to Sophie. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Again, the comments um, do show the Q&A link for the Zoom. I don't know about you all. I'm a young alum, and I am very excited to hear about this Q&A, dive down deep into it a little bit more. So um, thank you. If you're heading over to the Q&A, we'll see you there. If you're logging off or if you're watching virtually on the recording, thank you for attending. Have a great night, and go Rams! Woo!